to talk about something that's very, very dear to my soul. It's the, it's the central focus of my life. You know, when I read uh, in the Amplified Classic, one of the statements that Paul said, he said, for my determined purpose is to know him. You know, and, and I could honestly say that is growing in me every moment of every day of my life. Now, you know, the Lord told me during worship, we're going we're gonna to talk about the Word of God tonight. We're going to talk about Jesus. Um, I think I have about two weeks left of the teaching on the rapture of the church. So don't lose sight of this. Now, next Wednesday night, I want to encourage you, tell your friends, uh, Pastor Hagen, the Rama Crusade team is going to be here. And so next Wednesday night, we're going to launch off that three-night uh, crusade. And so once, after that's done, the next, the following Wednesday, we'll jump back into the rapture of the church. I really want to specifically get into uh, very specific things, like when do we think the rapture is going to take place? Like there's, there's a very, very clear teaching in the word of God about probably the feast day that the rapture is going to fulfill. So I want to talk about that so that you have great understanding of that. And then I want to go into not only the feast day that will probably be when the rapture happens, and I'll, I'll let you in on that. It's uh, the next feast to be fulfilled is, is Rosh Hashanah. It's the Jewish New Year. It's called the Feast of Trumpets. So I think that there's probably a real good chance that the rapture of the church will happen on that day. Now, we wouldn't know the moment because it's a two-day floating holiday. This year, it's October 2nd through the 4th. And so, but it has within that day the last trump. You know, they blow trumpets, all this stuff. And so we want to talk about that because we want you to understand this. Remember, this teaching on the rapture of the church is designed to comfort you and to encourage you so that you could also encourage yourself, comfort yourself, and also others. Because I'm telling you, the, we have kind of the finish line in sight, guys. And you're running a race, whether you realize it or not. I think all of you do. And uh, we want to run strong. And then I want to get into not only that, that day, but let's talk about the numerical prophecies, Daniel's 70th week. I want to really go into Daniel chapter 9 and really talk about some of the things that have taken place in the earth, how that we know that we know that we know that we're in the season of his coming and that his coming is very soon. And uh, so I want to finish that. We're going to finish very strong. But tonight we're going to get in the word of God. I, I know many, maybe many people need this. I, I, I would say I need this. I love every word of God. When you look at your Bible you need to realize that Jesus is the Word of God. The Word of God is not a book, it's a person, okay? There's a vital link between God and man, and that vital link is the Word of God. It's how we know Him. So let's look at this. Let's look at what it says. It literally says, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, right, was the Word, in the beginning, in the beginning, the Word. The Word was with God. In other words, the Word was face to face with God. And look at this, and the Word was God. Okay? So now, the Word was God. Look at what it says in verse 3, or at verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Made by who? The Word. Who's the word? Jesus. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then here we go. It gives us the word. This is the key word in John's gospel. It's the word life. In him was life, and the life was the light or the development of men. Wow. Wow. See, God's word in our spirit, it works in us and will be a source of spiritual development. The word of God is what will grow you up spiritually. It's what will strengthen your spirit. The word of God is what will produce everything. He sent his word and healed them. 
right? So important. If you jump down to verse 14, it says, and the word was made flesh. In the Greek language, it would say it like this, and the word took hold and seized upon, took upon himself flesh. Jesus literally unclothed himself with all of his godly glory and he clothed himself in human flesh. He was fashioned like a man. Why? So that he could come and give you and I his life. Not life like his, his very life. We were made his very righteousness. We were given his very life. And how we know him and how we know how to operate in life and in all this stuff is it's through the word of God. Okay? So this is so, so important. Hallelujah. See, how do you come into a deep, intimate knowledge of God? Through his word. That's how it happens, right? So we need to get in the word of God. We need to look at this like, listen, my determined purpose is to know him. Well, to know him, I've got to be in the word of God. To lay hold of everything, it all starts with the word of God. So let's back this up. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the word took upon himself flesh and dwelt among us. Now go to Revelation chapter 19 in verse 13. Revelation 19 in verse 13. So in this verse, we literally find what was the eternal name of Jesus. It, it gives us his name, right? Look at this. Revelation 19, 13, it says, And he was closed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So on the last day of the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation period, three days before that, last day, the two witnesses are going to be killed. The whole world's going to be rejoicing. On the last day of the tribulation, they are going to be raptured out. They're going to come back to life, and they're going to be taken up. And the whole world, the Bible says, is going to see them. You could see these two bodies healed, Raised up and they're going up. And then when, when everybody's looking up, the sky is going to roll back across the whole earth like a curtain. And this is what people are going to see. In verse 11 it says, I saw heaven opened. Behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. You know, he's not coming back as a lamb right? His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Wow. He had a name written so that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed, clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Jesus is the Word. So now let's look at eternal life. Go over to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Let's look at verse 3. I hope coming out of this service that you have an ignited fire in your belly to get in the word of God and make it the very center of your life. Because the Holy Spirit, the predominant ministry of the Holy Spirit is your helper, is to bring revelation knowledge to who Jesus is to you. Because everything flows out of that. Everything flows out of that. So John chapter 17 verse 3 it says, and this is life eternal. Boy, the whole book of John, he talks about life. What is eternal life? John says, this is eternal life. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That they may know thee. What is eternal life? Going to heaven? No. Nope. You know what makes heaven heaven? Jesus is there, right? Do you realize you and I are going to live in his presence with him forever? We're going to be in heaven for seven years and we're coming back to earth, right? But eternal life, I always thought eternal life, when I got saved, I thought, okay, great, I'm going to heaven, right? And then I realized as I grew up, the Bible talks more about me bringing heaven to this earth than me going to heaven, 
But I have eternal life right now because eternal life is knowing him. And he has given us his word so that we can know him. Well, we're in John, go to, verse, or go to chapter 8. Probably a, a scripture you haven't seen this week or you haven't heard me say this week yet. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. Look at this, it says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if, it's, it's always these if statements. Do you notice? We talk so much about, well, you know, God is sovereign, so just whatever he wants is what's going to happen, and it doesn't work that way. He did not sign, he is sovereign, but he didn't set it up that way. If, Jesus said to those, those people who believed on him, he said, guys, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciple. Big difference between somebody who's a believer and a disciple. A disciple is a follower of Christ. How do you know if you're a disciple? Are you continuing in the word of God? If you continue in the word, you'll go from a believer to a disciple. And you'll know the truth. Well, now wait a minute. John 17, 17 says his word is truth. In other words, if you continue in my word, then you'll know the word. You'll know the truth. And the truth or the word will make you free. How do you know the truth of God's word? Only one way. You have to know him. And, it, and you know him by continuing could you imagine, so on August 20th, 35 years ago, I, there was a young lady who moved from Iowa, and I saw the back of her head in a church service, and the Lord spoke to me. You're looking, those of you behind her are seeing her back of her head right now, right? <laughs> well, could you imagine if I was so excited, I had the whole world looking for her while I was on a business trip in New York. I'm like, why did I not ask her out, right? And so, could you imagine if, if during this time, we go out on our first date, and I'm 15 minutes into the date, and I'm like, wow, I've had just a great time, but I got some other stuff I got to do, and I just take her, drive her back home, leave her there, and go, and I'll call you, and then like a month later, if I would have called Jeanette a month later, guess what? She would not have answered, <laughs> right? Right? I mean, because she's not, she's not compromising, so... I mean, I had to marry her quick to keep from dying of a lack of REM sleep because all I wanted to do was be with her, right? And so I would continue with Jeanette. I've continued with her. She still, you would think after 35 years, I can get, it's easier to ask her out and get her to say yes. She still makes me work on that. I'm like, although you asked me out to breakfast the other day. Yeah, she did. Or she gave me this look and said, I'd go to breakfast with you, right? <laughs> so, but, but we've continued, so I know her. And we'll continue, and I'll, and I'll get to know her more intimately. Why wouldn't it be that way with God? So many people, they don't trust God because they don't know him. They don't know him because they don't continue. They don't walk with him. They, I mean, you know, it's bad when you got to dust off your Bible, See, people don't even dust off their Bible and bring it to church anymore because they got their phone or a tablet or something, right? But no, you know God through his word. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You'll know the truth, and the truth, the word, will make you free. You're not to make yourself free. Well, I'll tell you, if you've ever been addicted to anything, you should be shouting, running, screaming, because, wow, you mean I don't have to overcome this? I don't have to make myself free? Yes. You don't have to do it in your own self. In other words, the word will change everything. It will literally transform you into the very image of Jesus from glory to glory, even as by the Holy Spirit. That's what the word of God says. So that you can walk as he walked, so that you can do greater works than he did. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Because as he is, so are, we. so are we in this world. As he is, seated at the right hand, yeah. right? Guess what? We're seated in him right now. So this is how we know this is by continuing. So go over to Psalm 119. 
Psalm 119, we're going to probably spend a lot of time there. I have no idea, but I would venture to say that. Psalm 119, look at verse 89. Look at this. We're going to talk about the Word of God. It says here in Psalm 119, verse 89, it says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. It's settled. This Hebrew word settled means it's established and it forever stands in heaven. It's not movable. It can't be changed. If God said, I've redeemed you from the curse of the law, and if the word of God says the curse of the law, Deuteronomy 28.61 says it includes all sickness, all disease. If Deuteronomy 28, the curse of the law includes all poverty, all lack. If he said he redeemed you, that means he paid a price, his blood took you out of the delegated influence of darkness, put you forever in the kingdom of God, and you're redeemed. If, if the word says it, it forever stands. So in other words, if God's word says something, it's final. You have to know this. Because, you know, Brother Hagen made this statement. It used to make me mad because I was so stupid. You know, you know he's just so simple. He's like, well, you know, the word of God works if you work it. I'm like, okay, I moved out of Southern California, came to Broken Arrow, Oklahoma to hear that. Are you kidding me? Right, I could have got the tape. Here I am 30, some, 30 years later, whatever, going, wow, that's deep. Because you know, the word of God, it works every time. If you'll work it, how do you work it? You continue in it. That's how you work it. So, so very important. What's a New Testament scripture that says kind of the same thing? Go to Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. It's towards the end of the chapter here. Verse 35. Look at this. It says, heaven and earth shall pass away. This phrase in the Greek, pass away, means shall be changed from one condition to a new, to another. At the end of the tribulation period, we're going to go into the millennial reign of Christ. Jesus is going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. We're going to rule and reign with him. At the end of that thousand years, hell will be emptied. All the unbelievers will be, now everyone who's not accepted Christ will literally stand before the great white throne judgment, will be taken off the earth, and then the earth will be made new with fire. Same planet, he's just going to make it new. I, I love the wording because it's, 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 it's new. The word literally denotes it will always stay new. So it, it's like with God, if God made a car, it would always have a new car smell. It would No, no dust, no nothing, it would always be new, right? That's the way the earth is going to be. And, and it says a new heaven and earth, heaven being the initial atmosphere around the earth because it's going to be so messed up with whatever we've done to it with nuclear war and whatever. It seems like that's kind of described. So, and, it, and it's, it's, here it is, it's, it's new in kind too. So, you know, in eternity, it's going to be different. God doesn't say a lot about it. It's going to be new in kind. New Jerusalem, think about that. The city of God's going to come down. 1,500 miles wide. I could, that's almost from here almost to California. 1,500 miles deep, right? Wow, that's like from here almost all the way to Florida. But here's where it kind of gets a little different. 1,500 miles high. How, uh, how, that's, that's way in outer space. I don't know how many miles is it from where, they, where, where space starts. Do you, do you have any idea? Okay, if somebody Googles that, it's, it's not anywhere close to 1,500 miles. So, you know, you're kind of like, and then the Holy Spirit will go, that's really cool, now get your eyes back on, come back here, live right now, right? But a new heaven and new earth, but look at that, that'll pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Wow, that's kind of interesting. Do you know that this is a word planet? This planet was, everything we see was created by something you can't see. It was created by words. 
This is why God says life and death is in the power of the tongue because words, they're not just sounds, they're spirit. And if they're God's words, they're life. If they're the enemy's words or anything that's not God's words, they're death. They will produce things, right? So his, his word is life and it forever stands. It'll never pass away. Never pass away. That means you, if you find God's will in the word of God, you can lay hold of it and it'll change anything here, right? So I hope this builds your faith just a little bit. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my will, but my words shall not pass away. Wow. They will not change from one condition to another. Heaven and earth is going to change from one condition to another, but my, words is, my word is never going to change. God never changes. Sometimes people feel that God doesn't love them. How is that possible? He never changes. Let that comfort you. When you mess up, guess what that'll cause you to do? You'll run to him. You won't run away from him. Because you'll realize he loves you just as much. Right? So important. Let's go over to Psalm 138. Psalm 138. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's look at verse 1 and verse 2 here. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all of thy name. God has literally, literally magnified his word above all of his name. That's amazing. You can trust him. If he said it, the Bible says, he will do it. If he spoke it, he will bring it to pass. And who cares what the circumstances are telling you? Don't go by what your body's telling you. You want to know if you're healed? Go to Isaiah 53, 1. Believe his report. If you want to know the truth of your situation, go to the word of God. So let's keep going with this. I will worship towards thy holy temple. Worship, praise, all of this stuff because you have magnified your word above all of your name. Wow, that's amazing. So you're Psalm 138. Let's go to Psalm 119 again. Let's look back here. Psalm 119, verse 65. So we see God's word. First of all, Jesus is the word. To know him, we're going to know him through the word, okay? His word never changes. It forever stands in heaven. It's not subject to change. Nobody could change it. If you believe it and speak it, there's no way it won't come to pass. Right? So now we see that God exalts his word above his very name. Now look at this in verse 65 of Psalm 119. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord. How does God deal with his servant or New Testament with his children? According to your word. Do you know God deals with you according to his word and according to your word? They both have to match. Because if your word doesn't match his word, he can't force that on you. Does that make sense? That's why in Hebrews it says, hold fast, seize hold of the profession of your faith without wavering. That word profession is the Greek word homo logeo. It means to say the same thing. You have to say the same thing as God says. So if God says you're strong, you can't walk around saying, I feel so weak. Right? 
If God says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, you can't walk around saying, I just can't do this. If Jesus, if you really believe it, and I'm here to tell you guys, you're believers. You're made to believe him. It's not natural for you to believe the outside circumstances of your life. When you actually focus on them and look to them and you start moving in that direction, you'll have inner turmoil because your spirit's going, what are you doing? Yeah. Right? He deals with us according to his word. Let's go to Jeremiah. We got to go there. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12. Jeremiah 1, 12. Hallelujah. You guys doing okay? Praise God. Where is Jeremiah in this Bible? Man, yikes. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 12. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten. That Hebrew word means I will watch over my word to perform it. God tells Moses, why are you crying to me about the Egyptian army coming and the Red Sea on the other side? Stop crying to me. Take the staff which I gave you and I want you, Mo, I want you to part the Red Sea and cross over on dry ground. So Moses takes the staff, which is a type of the name of Jesus. He, he raises it and then what does it say? God parted the Red Sea. In other words, Mo, Moses did what God told him to do and then God performed it, right? That's the way it works. When you speak in the name of Jesus, guess what? God comes on the scene and performs it, right? Now, what happens to us? Why do things not change many times? Because we get distracted, right? We have these squirrel moments. We come to church, and we get our answer, and then 25 texts and 50 emails and Instagrams and Facebook and all this other stuff later, 19 meetings at work and micromanaged to the hilt because of technology, and all of a sudden, we just forget about it. We get distracted. I'm here to tell you the Holy Spirit will get you laser focused on how to operate in this world, in your career, in your job, at a much higher level while being focused on the word of God. He does that. He, you make him the center. But see, you gotta, you gotta get out of the boat. What's that boat? You gotta get out of the boat of I don't have enough time. You have to literally sit down and go, okay, I'm making a decision that God will be number one in my life. I, if, he, if it says it in the word, I'm doing it. I don't care what the results are, I'm doing it right? I'm going to put him first. He's first when I wake up. Somewhere in the middle of the day, I'm going to find some time, right? At the end of the day, he's always going to be the last thing I do before I lay my head down, spend time with him. And in between, he's going to give me, the Holy Spirit's going to help me have a scripture or two that I'm constantly confessing as I'm going throughout my day. I'm going to pray in my prayer language under my breath, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord. Man, I'm telling you, he will reprioritize your life. He'll help you. But pastor, I'm working. I have to work during church. I have to do this. Yeah, that's okay. Don't worry about that. Go work hard. But start believing God to open up that schedule and see if God won't do it. Can no longer say nothing. You can't look at something and go, man, that's impossible. You can't do that anymore if you believe his word because he says all things are possible to him who believes. You can't, you can't say anymore, man, I'm sure worried about my kids. If he says, no, 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 you're righteous, your children will be taught of the Lord and great will be the peace of your children and they'll be the head and not the tail and your seed will be mighty on the earth. It'll change everything about the way that we operate here, right? Right? He deals with us. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten or I will watch over my word to perform it. Can you put this verse up in the Amplified Classic? 
I love the way it says it in this, in this translation. The Amplified Classic. Hallelujah. Then said the Lord to me, you have well seen, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. How does he watch over his word? He's got to watch. He watches over it as it comes out of your heart through your mouth. If it's not coming out of your mouth, he has nothing to watch over. Yeah, but his word is just in my heart. Well, if it's not coming out of your, if it's not coming out of your mouth, then it's not in abundance. But he watches over. Give him something to watch over, right? It's kind of like you could believe God all day for, a, for him to fill your barns with plenty and to fill your storehouses, but if you don't have one, right? Go, go open up a checking account or a high-yield savings account. Call it your God account, right? And start believing God for money. See what happens to that account, right? Because if you honor God, in, your, in tithes and offerings, it says he'll fill your barns. Your wine presses will burst out with new wine. That's new, new income streams, new opportunity, new technology, an idea for a business that changes your financial life. All of that starts as we continue in the word of God. He watches over his word to perform it. Isn't that good news? So words, we talked a little bit about that. Let's go to John chapter 6 and verse 63. John chapter 6 in verse 63. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, you got to know this. Words are not just sounds, right? Words are a spiritual force that are going to do something. Do you know God doesn't speak any idle words? As a Christian, you and I are not to speak idle words. When we speak, we speak the word of God. Why? To put spiritual law in motion. Because words are so important. God says this in, the, in his word. Jesus talking, he says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They are zoe life. Isn't that interesting? The word came to give us the word, which is full of life. I came that you might have life, zoe, and have it more abundantly. Well, what's another way to say that? I came that you might have my word and that you might have my word more abundantly because my word is what's going to produce the zoe life in your life. What am I saying? God's word is your answer. And, and you haven't messed it up. If you could still fog a mirror, I don't see any corpses here tonight. Everything about your life can change. You apply the word of God to it. And you gotta realize, though, the word is not ink on a page. It's not some intellectual thing. It's not about memorizing. No, it's about meditating in so the Holy Spirit can open it so that you can get to know him. Right? So let's go to Matthew chapter 4 in verse 4. Another thing about the Word of God. Hallelujah. Boy, I hope this is as thrilling you as much as it's thrilling me. So Jesus, he's led up in a wilderness to be tempted of the enemy. When the enemy comes to him, the first thing he does, when the tempter came in him, verse 3, and he came in his thoughts, Jesus was tempted in every way, right? This word, he, it, it, to, he, he came by analogy. In other words, he's dropping thoughts in Jesus' head, in Jesus' mind, and it's a genuine temptation. We all know that because, man, temptations are real, aren't they? But when the tempter came to him, what's the first thing he said? He came against his identity. He said, if you be the son of God. He's coming against his identity. Guess what, say, guess what the enemy's going to come against you with? your identity. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You just messed up one too many times. Look at your past. There's no way this could happen. Identity, identity, identity. He's going to come to you and say, well, if you be a child of God, are you really? Look at, what, look at your behavior over here, right? 
What did Jesus say? Jesus answered. Well, the tempter came and said that, if you be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So think about that. Have you ever been really hungry and smelled warm bread? Wow, right? So, so the enemy hit him. And when you fast 40 days, a hunger comes back that has disappeared. And it's a starvation hunger. Every system in your body is depleted and a starvation hunger comes at the end of 40 days to where it's telling your body's screaming at you, eat or you will die. The tempter comes at his weakest moment physically and says, hey, if you're the son of God, these stones here, make them bread. Now it had to be a temptation. Jesus could have done that, right? Otherwise it wasn't a temptation. But look at how he answered. Jesus answered and says, listen, listen, devil, man does not live by bread alone. But then he tells us a great truth. But man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That is how we live. Wow. Right? So now go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Oh my gosh, I have so many scriptures here. Psalm 119. Hallelujah, I'm in Nehemiah. Psalm 119, verse 130. Let's look at this. See, revelation knowledge of God's word, it literally, it, it changes our thinking and it will literally inspire you to believe. Revelation knowledge it has to come. When light comes, something happens. In every faith, in every bit of your walk of faith, when you're in a battle for anything, there's going to come a point when light's going to come and it's going to change everything. So look at this. Verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. Wow. In him was life. And the life was the light of men, John 1, 4. The entrance of his words gives light. So the entrance, that, that Hebrew word means the opening of his word. When, when the Holy Spirit opens the word of God on the inside of you, light comes. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In other words, when the word opens up, guess what comes out? Life comes out. And how can you tell it's life? Because it's light. And it will develop you. The entrance of his word gives light. Look at this. It gives understanding. This word understanding literally means discernment. Discernment. What is discernment? That means to see and know. Discernment is seeing with your spirit. When the word of God opens up, you no longer are seeing the natural circumstances. You now see out of your spirit. It's a different level of seeing. It gives understanding to the simple. Now that's a very nice word for that King James translator. He said simple. You know what that Hebrew word really means? Stupid. Right? Something, if, you're ever, if you've ever been stupid, it literally means you had the ability to know this, but you just chose not to. Right? See, we walk through life thinking we know so much. Then we come to God, and as we walk with him, we come and we realize, man, without him, I don't know anything. So I have to completely rely on him for everything. When his word opens up on the inside of you, it gives you what? It gives you life, it's light, and it'll give you understanding. It'll cause you to see at a deeper level. See, in the natural, you might see the natural circumstances. You see the natural circumstances. You feel the pain. You see the MRI. You see all this stuff going on. But when the word of God rises up in your spirit, you start to see things as they really are. Wait a minute. That has no legal right in my body. 
He sent his word and healed me. He forgives all my transgressions. He healed all of my diseases. Sickness, you got to go, right? So this is very, very important. So jump back to verse 105, the same chapter. So we, we started out by saying the entrance of his word or the opening of his word gives light. Well, what is this light? Thy word is a lamp unto your feet. It will tell you where you are at. Nothing else, other, no, nothing, nothing else will tell you that. Oh, you might, you're naturalized and you might really think you see where you really are at. But you got to be careful with that. Because you could look around and go, man, I am in trouble. I am defeated. There is no way out. But remember, the word is what is a lamp to your feet. And it's also a light to your path. It tells you where to go. Right? In other words, the word of God is a light to your path. The word of God gives you hope for a prosperous future. The word of God shows you that there is a way out even though maybe you don't see it yet, but the word of God will show it to you. In other words, Jesus, the word, is your everything. Well, I wonder what we can do if we just stop believing all that we're seeing and live in a higher level and just live by what he told us. Hmm, wow, right? Thy word is a lamp to my feet it's a light to my path. It tells me where I'm at. It tells me where I'm going. It is food for me. It is the food that spiritually develops me. It's how I live and move and have my being. I've got to continue in the word of God. And in our environment, guys, that means you have to be careful what you're hearing. Not everything that's called Christian is Bible, right? But the Holy Spirit will help you, right? Right? So let's look at something else. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 20. It says, my son, attend to my words. Put my words first place in your life. Incline your ear to my sayings, right? Give, give my word your undivided attention. Keep my word before your eyes. Never let the word of God depart from your eyes. Keep it in the midst of your heart. Why? For it is life. The word of God is life to those who find it and health or medicine to all their flesh. Wow. The word of God not only tells you where you are, tells you where you're going. The word of God is life. It's your food. It's your everything. Now it even tells you here that it's medicine to all your flesh. You, you know, you live in a body that is subject to sickness and disease. It's a body that has not been glorified yet. We don't have our, we don't have our glorified bodies yet, so it's subject to sick, sickness and disease. It's, it's subject to aging. We're going to age, but you don't have to age sick and weak and in pain. But in order to do that, that won't happen automatically. you gotta, you got to hook up that internal IV. The word of God is life to those that find it, and it's medicine to all their flesh. All their flesh. Aren't you glad you don't have to know everything that's wrong with you? Aren't you glad that you could be healed of something that never even know you had it? Right? Sounds a lot like Romans 8, 11, that with the same, with the same power that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus' body from the dead with, with that same power, he's on the inside of you and I, and he will quicken our mortal bodies. That means to heal, restore to health, and make whole our mortal bodies by the Spirit. He, he wants, we've got to keep that flow going. Yeah. Right? Oh, you're going to get some wrinkles. You might not be able to dunk a basketball, but man, you could still play in the game called life. You could still walk out God's plan for your life. And I don't know, I'm telling you, when you get older and you walk with the Lord for a while, you start to know him. I mean, you think, I mean, right now where I'm at, I feel like I know so little about him, and that thrills me. Because the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know, but that just means he's so glorious. But I also know this, I'll always, I'll always know exactly what I need to know in every situation. Amen. And the only reason why I might not, see, you talk to me a thousand years from now, I'm gonna know a lot more than I know now. 
right? You'll be walking up to me going, Pastor, wow, we were really in kindergarten back there. Yeah, yeah, right? But wasn't kindergarten great, right? We could stomp all over the enemy with kindergarten, right? Just take spiritual crayons and just <laughs> blot them out, right? Beat them up with that pen. We used to have these pencils. Have you ever seen those pencils when you were little, those thick thing? Oh, have you ever been hit? I had a friend, I just smacked me right in the head. Oh, now I'd love to do that to Satan. Just go, bam, how does that feel, right? How did I get off on all that? We need to keep going. Let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. I hope you're taking some notes. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. Look at this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. In the Greek language, that means all scripture is breathed. It's God breathed. He breathed it all. It was penned by many authors, but it's all one message. It's not the words of God. It's the word of God. It all fits because he breathed it all. And it's profitable for doctrine. That means it's profitable to instruct us and to teach us. It's profitable for reproof. In other words, it's profitable. It gives us proof. I have proof that I'm blessed. I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I'm blessed with the root that will produce all the fruit in my life. I'm blessed with all, I've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. Right? It gives me the proof. How do you know that, Tony? The word of God says it. And it's not subject to change. It's profitable for correction. Thank God for that. The word corrects me. God doesn't cause a negative circumstance to hurt you, to teach you something. In the same way, you know what? I'm not going to take my grandson and say, okay, come here. Today, we're going to teach you how not to ever touch the stove, right? Give me your hand. No, that's not what God does. That sounds silly, but that kind of stuff is being preached. He corrects us with his word. It's, it's also profitable, it, it instructs us in righteousness. It, it teaches us how to walk righteous. Don't put up with that, you're righteous. Right? You have authority over him, you're righteous. Right? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, thoroughly qualified. Thir this, this word furnished literally means qualified and fresh. You gotta be fresh. If you're trying to tell somebody about Jesus and you're just like, hey, you know, Jeanette, let me, let me tell you about the Lord. You know, I have no idea why all this stuff has happened to me, but, you know, God is good. The world's going, what? No, no, when you walk with God, it's fresh. Right? The scripture, Jesus wept, you could read it a hundred times in a row and you're like, wow. Right? But we read that scripture, oh yeah, Jesus wept. He was just so sad that his friend Lazarus died. No, he was weeping because of their lack of faith. Because Martha, listen, the resurrection is not a day. I am the resurrection. Boy, let's get that right, right? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's talk about another scripture, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hallelujah. Guys, I can't tell you how important it is that you become a person of the word of God in these final days. Because I'm telling you, the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And he has no authority to do any of that in your life. But he doesn't play by the rules unless you make him. And you got to submit yourself to God so that you can stand against and oppose him so that you could laugh as he runs as in terror away from you, right? Because that's who you are in Christ. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, for the word of God is quick. This Greek word means it is full of life. And it's powerful. 
This Greek word means it's active and it's effective and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. In other words, the word of God is the only thing that could tell you if what I'm thinking about doing, is it me or is it, am I being led by the spirit of God? There's only one thing that could tell you whether it's you or whether it's God and it's the word. So if somebody comes and tells me, well, you know, as a pastor, many times people come to me and they'll say, hey, you know what? The Lord told me this, right? The Lord told me this, so what do you think about that? I, I'm, I'm out at that point. I can't, even though it might violate four scriptures that I'm just thinking about, I'm never gonna, I'm gonna say, well, you gotta be led by the Spirit. But get away from that stuff. Submit yourself to the Word and be led by the Spirit of God, right? If God's leading you, you know how many times I have heard, yeah, God's, God's leading us to leave, or God's leading me to do this, or God's leading me to do that. And then you ask him, okay, well, that's great. What two or three scriptures is blowing up in your heart that he's leading you by? And it's deer in the headlights. Well, what do you mean? I got a word from somebody. Time out. Be careful with that. Yeah. Right? See, if God's leading you, if the word of God is really the lamp of, to your feet and a light to your path, I, I mean, I could tell you the three scriptures God gave me when, when God told us we were going to pioneer a church here. I, I knew them. I still meditate in them all the time. Joshua 1.5. Psalm 1, 1 through 3, specifically verse 3, Isaiah 54, 17. Those, those three scriptures, I mean, all over and over. That was the light and the lamp for me. Thank God, man, as, we, as we've walked, we just literally love people. We love people that are trying to hurt us. We love people when everything looks like it's going a different way because we don't care because no weapon formed against us will prosper, Isaiah 54. I'm just able, I never, I never get concerned about any of it because Joshua 1, 5, as he was with Moses, so he will be with me. No man will ever stand before me and block me from doing what God's called me to do. And Psalm 1, 3, listen, for everything that I'm called to do in the earth to come to maturity, it's not based on what other people do. It's based on, am I going to delight myself in the Lord and meditate in his word day and night? Because if I will, I'll be like a tree planted by rivers of water. My leaf won't wither. I'll yield all of my fruit in my season and whatever I put my hand to, God will bring it to maturity. Those three verses, I could tell you that is what got Jeanette and I here. And what will keep us here. So, so this is why we're teaching about the word. If you don't have two or three verses, relax a little bit. Take some time. You're never going to miss God by going a little bit slow. Now, I will say this. The Lord has had to tell me in over 17 years of pastoring this church, he's come to me at times. And he said, Tony, you're a little bit behind the curve. We, we need you to kind of move a little bit more, right? But you know, I'd much rather him come to me and tell me that because years ago, he's like, Tony, it's really hard for you to be led by my spirit when you're out there doing your own thing and just running and, right? And he's gracious. See, because you're born of God, you overcome the world. The victory that overcomes the world is your faith. When you hear God's word that he's provided healing for you, sickness is done. When you hear God's word that he has redeemed you from poverty and lack and that he's your source of supply, your financial life, it changes instantly. That's your victory. Do you see that? It's all the word. Stop trying to do it on your, on your own. It pierces, a, uh, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. It will discern. It will show me, Tony, this is just your flesh. Tony, this is a counterfeit thought that the enemy's trying to give you. 
But over here, as I'm delighting in the Lord, man, that desire gets so big, and all of a sudden, the Word of God just lights it, and I'm like, okay, this is the way I'm supposed to go. And you just know. Because see, if you go a wrong way in God, He's so merciful. If you just run back to Him, you'll heal eventually. I mean, I was called to pioneer a church. I was called to go to Ramah when I was 20. Why Ramah? I don't know, but that's where he called me. Right? Does that mean Ramah's the greatest Bible school in the world? Well, for me it was, because that's where he called me to go. I can't say if it's for anybody else. Right? Does that make sense? But I didn't get there till I was 30 because of my own stupidity and stubbornness. And then, then I knew that I was to pioneer a church, but man, I went through a massive church split in a church when I, was in my, when I was a younger man. I saw what they did to that pastor, and I'm like, oh man, I can't be that guy, right? So I didn't actually step into, I mean, literally, by 25, I should have been pioneering a church. Didn't quite get there till I started at 45. Those trips around the mountain, you do stupid things. But guess what? Even though I might have wasted 20 years, it's not really a waste. God is able to redeem the time. I know, I'm still, it's going to be so cool. The day we go from faith to sight, and I'm standing before the Lord. This guy who had nothing to do with being made righteous, with finishing my course, other than I was just willing and obedient, he's going to hear the righteous judge of all creation say, Tony, well done, good and faithful servant. Do you know he's going to say that to you too? God is a God, he redeems the time. I get so excited about this, but it all gets back to the word. So what should we do? Well, I have so many scriptures, but we're going to, we're going to kind of slow down here and kind of close this out a little bit. Go to Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Child of God, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here because you guys are people of the word. But I'm telling you, just keep going deeper. Keep going, running harder, right? The, here's the thing. When you go deeper and run harder in God, you know what that looks like in your life? More peace, more quiet assurance, more rest, less toil. Amen. Schedule gets better. No, it might not in the natural, but in reality, it gets better. Because the Holy Spirit will be like, yeah, those 25 things, just relax. Yeah. Spend some time with me. And he always works it out. Look at this. Verse 16, let. So that word in the Greek means allow. So that tells me that you're in control of this. You have to let this happen. You have to allow this. You allow what? You have to allow the anointed words of Christ to dwell in you, to dwell, dwell, dwell in you richly. Dwell, that's not a hotel, right? But most people live like where they're allowing the word to dwell in them like a hotel. So they check in and then they check out. You don't want to ever check out. Because if his words abide in you and you abide in him, then you will ask what you will and it'll be done. See, when you abide under the shadow of the Almighty, a thousand fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it doesn't come near you, right? So you want to abide. You got to allow, allow the words of Christ to dwell in you richly. What else can you do? Go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter two. Is it okay to read half a verse? It is tonight. 1 Peter chapter 2. <laughs> look at this. Let's look at, let's start in verse 1. Hallelujah. See, you got to know this. God's word, it's not understood with your intellect. It is grasped by your spirit. Why? How? How does your spirit grasp it as the Holy Spirit reveals it to you? That's how this deal works. So it says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes 
desire. This means intensely crave. Intensely crave the possession of. As a newborn baby, you mothers, wow, right? That newborn, you don't have to figure out when they're hungry. These little guys and these little girls, when they get hungry, you know it, don't they? Don't you? I mean, I want food. They intensely crave it. I don't want a binky. I don't want anything else. I want food right now. Right? That's how you're to crave the word of God. I could tell you guys, that's the way I crave it. I, I try to figure out ways to spend more time with him. Wow. Wow. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Wow. Let's close with Jeremiah 15. Let's go to Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Jeremiah 15, hallelujah, verse 16. I'll just close with that. We'll just, we'll just pause with that. I love this. Jeremiah, boy, I love this scripture. It says, thy words were found, and I did eat them. And, they, and thy word was unto me, look at this, the joy and rejoicing of my heart. See, when you, the word of God is not boring. When you find it, see, most people just read it. And you could read it and go, I don't understand this. Just keep reading, right? Like, like finding Nemo, just keep swimming, just, just keep reading, just keep reading, right? Because when that starts opening up, you'll start intensely craving it because it becomes the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Why? Because as I read his words, I gain a revelation of this. For I am called by thy name. Oh, Lord, God of hosts. In other words, what happens when I find the word of God, it becomes the joy and rejoicing of my heart because I finally find out who I am in him. And I realize I'm his child. He loves me. And I'm able to love him and love others based on him first loving me that he took me out of darkness. I was dead, and now I'm fully alive. I was blind, and now I see. I was lost, and now I'm found. I was an orphan, and now I've got a family. His word is the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I'm telling you what, it is August. You can go to a whole new place by the end of this year if you'll give yourself to this. Now, I'm talking to a bunch of people that love the word of God. But I'm telling you, you can still go deeper. I believe I'm going to be in a different place by October 1st. Really? Right? In the natural, I really am. I'm going to be in Newport Beach, California. But spiritually, <laughs> spiritually, spiritually, you could be in a different place. God is irresistible. He told me that the night before our first service. He's irresistible. Man, I'm learning more and more about that. Guys, when Jesus said, it is finished, that means Satan is finished in your life. Whatever he's done to you up to this point, no more. You draw a line in the sand and you say, no more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give myself to this. Forget about what God's called me to do, ministry, who I'm going to marry, what I'm going to go, where I'm going to go, where I'm going to live. Forget all of that. You want to find out God's will for your life? Here it is. His will is that you be fashioned into the very image of Jesus. And the only way that that could happen is by you getting to know him. Amen.